All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, for this conference, we asked Alex Gardner to come and be a connection between each panel and help us with questions and um, with the flow of the whole conference. So I'm really glad that Alex is here um, to support us and to help us with everything. So Alex Gardner, in case you don't know, is uh, the executive director of the Treasury of Lives project and the chief editor of that project. Um, it's one of the great online projects that um, if you don't know about already, please do go check it out. Um, it's really wonderful. And many of you perhaps are already authors who have done some of the biographies there. And if you're not yet, you could check with him at some point during the breaks. Maybe not when he's on stage, but uh, <laughs> so we're going to get started right now with Alex and then Susan. Thank you. So, uh, so it's a great uh, honor to, uh, to serve as a facilitator for this conference, the 2017 uh, Translation and uh, Transmission Conference. Um, welcome to all of you. I am so eager to hear from all of you. Uh, the 2014 conference was a remarkable meeting of different perspectives and agendas. There was an openness and an inquiry and an air of mutual respect that made it really one of the most enjoyable conferences, one of the most inspiring conferences I've ever been to. I remember Professor Bellow's outline of Western translation history stemming from a poor Greek translation of the Pentateuch and a lost Latin translation of Homer. Janet Gyatso gave us the notion that knowledge is innately active, that such that any moment of insight carries with it the need to share it somehow. It's always being transmitted. It was three days of fantastic lectures and fascinating conversations on translation and transmission of Buddhism. What I think came clear to everyone was that there is a growing global community of Tibetan translators with a common goal of advancing translation tools and methods. In that is a dedication to sharing knowledge and expertise with each other and with the world. My goal for the next three days is to help us build on that. We have representatives from the many excellent translation committees, the models of collaboration, and some of the most preeminent academic scholars working today, as well as many independent translators, teachers, scholars, and interpreters from scores of institutions around the world, as a beautiful word, word cloud banner that was projected last night makes clear. I'm here to make sure that everyone is heard and that all perspectives are represented, and that the collaboration and camaraderie continues to grow. I am not a translator, but a scholar and an author and a practitioner who benefits enormously from your work. I look forward to the conversations about methods and challenges, and also your reflections on the meaning of why you do this, your insights into the role of translation in contemporary transmission of Buddhism. So with that, please allow me to introduce Susan Bassnett. Professor Bassnett is an internationally recognized expert in comparative literature and translation studies. In addition to having laid out many of the fundamentals for the field, she is also a scholar and a writer of poetry. Professor Bassnett has kindly agreed to address the conference on the topic of authority and the central paradox of the translator, at once passively absent and actively present, a topic which of course resonates well with the Tibetan literature with which we all work. So please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Bassnett to the podium. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers. It's a very, very great uh, pleasure and a great honor to have been invited and to come to this city that I last saw more years ago than I care to remember. I think it was sometime in the early 1970s, and things have changed quite a bit <laughs> since then. So thank you all. I'm going to start off with the preface to the 1611 King James Bible, entitled The Address of the Translators to the Reader, because it contains what I think is one of the most beautiful statements about the purpose of translation. And here is that statement. Translation it is 
that openeth the window to let in the light, that breaketh the shell that we may eat the kernel, that putteth aside the curtain that we may look into the most holy place, that removeth the cover of the well that we may come by the water. The metaphors here are all about nourishment of both the body and the soul. Translation enables us to eat, to drink. It gives us light. It pulls back the curtain so that we can share in the divine mystery. It's a wonderfully positive vision of translation. And interestingly, it posits translation not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end. Translation will give us the possibility of moving forward, will open up to us the way to start our journey, and in this case, towards the divine mysteries. Now, the King James Bible, which is also known as the authorized version, was produced by a group of scholars. I think the total is something like 54, with expertise in ancient Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, Syriac, Samaritan, and a host of other ancient Middle Eastern languages. Their meetings were held in Latin, the language of scholarship of the age. And the task was to produce a version of the Bible that would meet with royal approval and would replace previous English versions that had been considered in some ways corrupt. The version they were committed to produce was therefore not to be a totally new translation, but a revision. I quote again from the preface, not to make a new translation, but to make a good one better. They therefore drew upon a wide range of previous translations, aiming to steer a middle course between what was perceived as religious extremism manifested linguistically. And again, I quote, we have on the one side, say the translators, avoided the scrupulosity of the Puritans, <laughs> who leave the old ecclesiastical words and betake them to other, as when they put washing for baptism and congregation instead of church. As also on the other side, we have shunned the obscurity of the papists in their azimes, tunicae, rational, holocaust, and a number of such like, whereof their late translation is full. <laughs> they were also conscious of the need to produce a version that could be read aloud in churches. Bearing in mind, of course, that given the level of literacy of the population, not to mention the cost of printing books, only a tiny handful of people would ever have been privileged to own a copy. Reading at that point in time was not yet a silent enterprise, but a collective one. And this led to the emphasis on orality and rhythmical phrasing that ensured the success of their Bible for generations, and which has made it, along with the works of Shakespeare, the most influential text in English literature. One of the translations that the committee used was by William Tyndale, the first man to produce an English translation using ancient Greek and Hebrew sources, the first to use the new medium of print to disseminate his New Testament in 1526. It's generally agreed that a very large proportion of the authorized version relies on Tyndale's earlier version. But in his day, Tyndale was a very controversial figure. I think he must have been quite brilliant. But when he was at Oxford, he was renowned for his linguistic skills. He was well acquainted with Erasmus, with Martin Luther. But he became persona non grata in England after publishing an attack on Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon. <laughs> Thomas More despised him and published savage attacks on what he saw as Tyndale's heretical translation, urging, I quote, good Christian men that know these things for heresies to abhor and burn up his books. <laughs> Tyndale's opponents went even further. In 1536, when he was probably only just 42, he was executed. In what is now Belgium, he was strangled, and then his body burned to ashes at the stake. Before he died, he prayed that the King of England's eyes might be opened. Henry's eyes remained closed, as we know, and it was going to take another seven decades before the first Stuart monarch, James I of England, James VI of Scotland, would start the process of rehabilitating Tyndale through the use of his work in the authorized version. <laughs> 
And I've started out and dwelled for a few minutes on William Tyndale to make a point about the dangers inherent in translation. <laughs> I see I've touched a chord here. <laughs> Tyndale was not the only interpreter of sacred texts to be executed. We need only think of Jan Hus, Jerome of Prague, Etienne Dole, and although John Wycliffe died before he could actually be tried for heresy, they disinterred his bones 44 years after his death, publicly burned them and threw them into the local river. <laughs> Nor are translators out of danger today. The Japanese translator of Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses, Hitoshi Igarashi, was murdered by a religious fanatic in 1991. And we all read of the appalling risks taken by the translators and interpreters working for the UN in Iraq and Afghanistan, threatened with death by their own countrymen and not always helped by the nations who have used their skills. So we might ask, why, why would anyone feel threatened by a translator? Now the answer, of course, is linked to the very act of translating itself. Because translation involves taking something written in one language and transferring it into another. And the translator is the individual who has to negotiate that transfer. This means that those of us who cannot access the source language are totally dependent on the translator to provide us with a sense of what that source text is. In short, we have to trust the translator. We have to trust the translator to give us a sense of what we might call sameness to offer a version of something that we cannot understand and that we cannot read for ourselves. Octavio Paz, great translator as well as a great poet, has written about the ambiguities of translating exemplified in the figure of Donna Marina, known as La Malinche, the woman who was both mistress of Hernán Cortés and his interpreter. La Malinche appears to have been a native speaker of Nahuatl, who then acquired Mayan as a slave, then learned Spanish, becoming close to Cortes on account of her multilingualism. But as Paz shows, she is a highly ambiguous figure for posterity. Did she, as has been argued by some, contribute through her translating skills to the Spanish conquest of Mexico? Can she be viewed, as Paz puts it, as a figure representing the Indian women who were fascinated, violated, or seduced by the Spaniards. In other words, was she a victim or a collaborator? Or we could put the question another way, and we could say, what does it actually mean to collaborate? In English, we use that word in both a positive and a negative sense. Collaboration is good when people work together, as in this conference, bad when someone seems to be collaborating with an enemy. And so often translators have been, views, been viewed negatively as collaborators, as people standing at a threshold, neither inside nor outside, as people in no man's land, caught between different factions, sometimes warring factions as people who are not clearly located on one side or on the other, untrustworthy people, which of course doesn't make life easy for the translator. As Josephine Balmer, poet and translator of ancient Greek and Latin poetry puts it, I quote, it is often necessary to don a flak jacket to step out into the firing range of our no man's land between translation and original scholarship and creativity. I always rather like that, that image of the translator getting, putting on a flak jacket and stepping out into the place where he or she will be shot at on all sides. <laughs> I'll, come back, I'll come back to the distinction that she makes between scholarship and creativity. But underlining her point about the dangers of stepping out into no man's land is the basic question that affects all of us whenever any of us attempt any translation. What authority can a translation have? This is the vexed and vexatious question that has troubled translators, critics, and readers for centuries, for millennia. For whilst a translation may be intended as a valid representation of an original work composed in another language, in another place, and in another time, that assumption of validity raises the spectre of doubt as to the accuracy 
faithfulness, and indeed authenticity of the translation. And when I use the words accuracy, faithfulness, and authenticity, you should imagine them in little inverted commas. Images of negativity abound with regard to translation. There's the Italian adage, which was quoted by the dean last night, the traduttore traditore, translator, traitor, betrayer, which associates translation directly with betrayal. Then there's the old sexist notion of the bel infidèle, which suggests that if a translation is beautiful, then like a woman, it is bound to be unfaithful. <laughs> These are just two of the many figurative images highlighting the unfaithfulness of translations which exist alongside images of the inferiority of translation seen as derivative, copies, second class, um, reflections of a superior original that came into existence somewhere else. The 17th century English poet John Dryden famously compared the translator to an indentured laborer, forced to do his owner's bidding and never receiving thanks or praise for the work. <laughs> Here's Dryden's point, but slaves we are and labor on another man's plantation. We dress the vineyard, but the wine is the owner's. If the soil be sometime barren, then we are sure of being scourged. If it be fruitful and our care succeeds, we're not thanked. For the proud reader will only say, that poor drudge has done his duty. <laughs> now Dryden, like many other poets who wrote about translation, thankfully did not practice what he preached, and I think we can see these remarks here as containing a very heavy dose of irony. <clears throat> But it does point us to the problem of where does the duty and responsibility of the translator lie? Is the translator the servant, the slave even, of the original? And if the poor translator does succeed in making something that is appreciated by the new readers, does that subsequent acclaim belong to the translator or to the original author? And I'll give you a little anecdote here to illustrate this. I, heard the, the English novelist Penelope Lively give a rather splendid lecture on the development of the novel in the 20th century. And she was arguing that the greatest influence, the greatest impact on English 20th century novelists, on, on English modernism, had been the Russian novels of people like um, Tolstoy, Lemontov, Dostoevsky, Turgenev. And I was thinking, but none of these people read a word of Russian. They must have all read the Russian novels in translation. But the names of the translators weren't even mentioned. And the, 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 the texts were discussed, the works were discussed as if they'd been written in English all along. And when I was talking to Penelope afterwards and I raised this point, she said, I'm absolutely shocked by what you say. You're right, but I never even thought about it. Which brings me to the point that an awful lot of people never think about translation. <laughs> despite the enormous importance of translation in all our lives. We're actually living at a historical moment when millions more people than ever before are moving around the planet. We've seen the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, China opening up to the West, the end of apartheid in South Africa. These are all major political shifts that have led to millions more people acquiring passports and being able to travel freely. And if we add to that the millions moving because of wars, persecution, famine, the countless numbers of dispossessed exiles and migrants, all of whom speak different languages and have different concepts of culture, then I think we have some sense of how significant translation is becoming today. And if we turn from those broad socio-political transformations to textual questions, and I, 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 I always believe that socio-political events have epistemological consequences, something I've always believed, then we find that the interest in understanding what happens when cultures and languages come into contact with one another is on the increase and has been in the last few decades. I'm going to do a very brief autobiographical digression here, which is relevant, I hope. Just ready to tell you all that from the time when I learned to speak, I had a second language in my head. That language changed as I moved countries, but by the time I was 12 and I was starting to study French and Latin, 
I was at school, that is, I was trying to, I was starting to study languages formally. I was at school in Italy, so I was doing my, my, I was speaking English at home and I was translating Latin, Italian, Italian, Latin, etc. What this means, and I'm sure this is the, the story of many of you in this room, one becomes aware of linguistic and cultural difference from childhood, almost intuitively. One engages in a sort of shape-shifting, sensing that expressing oneself and expressing what one understands about the world is actually complex and subject to changes as one changes language. As a very small child, I knew that there were things I could say in one language and not in another. Later, as reading for children becomes more sophisticated, one can then see that modes of expression are different. A writer's styles, writer's styles vary. Writer's styles are unique. And so translating the uniqueness of that style becomes another challenge. Ezra Pound, who was an extraordinary translator and a much maligned translator, declared back in 1917 that a great age of literature is perhaps always a great age of translations or follows it. This comes from an essay of his on Elizabethan classicists, and he goes on to invite us to think about what a good translation is. Is a fine poet ever translated, says Pound, until another his equal invents a new style in a later language? Is any foreign speech ever our own, ever so full of beauty as our lingua materna, whatever lingua materna that may be, or is not a new beauty created, an old beauty doubled, when that overchange is well done? And note how Pound here uses overchange rather than change over to avoid using the word translation. Now, this is a very contentious point. Pound is suggesting that only a poet of equal competence is able to translate another poet's work in such a way as to bring that poet to life in a new language. Later on, in another of his famous essays on translating Guido Cavalcanti, the medieval Italian poet, Pound writes about how he gradually learned how to translate this highly sophisticated, complex writer. Writing in 1934, Pound says he first began translating Cavalcanti back in 1912, but, I quote, I did not see Guido then at all. What I think he's saying is that he hadn't yet found a style that suited Cavalcanti. And what blocked him was not so much his knowledge of Italian, but what he calls the crust of dead English, the sediment present in my own available vocabulary, adding, you just can't get round this sort of thing. It takes six or eight years to get educated in one's art, and another 10 to get rid of that education. <laughs> Something I've always liked. I quote that a lot to my students. I think that's, that's, that's kind of nice. Nor, Pound argues, can anyone really learn English. One can only learn a series of Englishes. This is a language with an enormous number of, of varieties, and as I'm sure many of you know, that, that, that um, in talking about global English, many people now refer to, in fact, global Englishes, a plurality of Englishes. But Pound says, in 1912, I hadn't made a language for myself. I don't mean a language to use, I mean a language to think in. And I find it interesting that Seamus Heaney says more or less exactly the same thing. And in the preface to his translation of Beowulf, which appeared in 1999, and was one of those mysterious things, which I think also indicates my, my belief in the rising significance of translation. This is an old English poem that went straight into bestseller lists. That's interesting. Why, why would Beowulf suddenly, which we were all um, compelled to translate at, at, at university, what had Heaney done? And Heaney actually says he tried to translate it in his youth. But he hadn't found the style, he hadn't found the language, the English, through which he could bring it meaningfully to contemporary readers. And he uses what I think is a beautiful image. He uses the image of the tuning fork. And he says only when he hits the right note with the tuning fork, when he hits that note, will he be able to produce a modern version 
of the ancient poem. I'm just going to leap back for a moment again into my autobiographical digressions. I studied English and Italian at university. I wrote a PhD on, I'm almost ashamed to admit this, Einstein's theory of relativity on the 20th century European stage. And if some of you think some of your work is uh, not particularly well known or maybe even obscure, try thinking of that. It was a re <laughs> ridiculous topic, absolutely ridiculous. Um, I, 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 I don't know where it is, it kind of disappeared into the mist. But when I first started um, in, uh, my first academic post was back in, in Italy. I taught English literature up to the Renaissance. In my first um, UK uh, post, I taught Anglo-Saxon, early Middle English, and creative writing. And I'm saying this because I, I want to sort of establish my credentials as an expert in nothing. <laughs> I think that's, that's quite important. Um, I work across various languages. I've translated poetry, prose, theater texts. I've translated an assortment of technical texts, including, I have to just add this, knitting patterns. <laughs> but all the time, all the time, the driving force has been acknowledging the significance of occupying a liminal space, an in-between space, and trying to prove that such a space is exciting and creative. It's a contact zone. It's a location where one has to try and look with more than one pair of eyes. I think sometimes expertise, and within the, the, the university world, it is now sadly so important to be considered an expert in something. I always try to make the case of it's just as important not to be an expert in anything. Though tenure track um, people, people responsible for tenure track probably wouldn't like that idea, but never mind. But it's a space where one has to be like the two-faced Roman god Janus, looking backwards and forwards simultaneously. Because a translator has to balance responsibility to the source, to the original, and to the new readers, who are only going to encounter that text through her or his mediation. Translation is therefore fundamentally not just an aesthetic, but an ethical activity. In the 1970s, still writing the awful PhD, I was lucky enough to encounter a group of people who were all in different ways wrestling with the contact zone. They came from Belgium, the Netherlands, from Israel, from what was then Czechoslovakia. And at one of a series of meetings, we put our name to what we proclaimed a manifesto for a new field called translation studies. That term, was devised by the late James Holmes, a marvelous character, a larger-than-life gay man, originally from the United States, who combined great scholarship with rather beautiful translations of Dutch and Indonesian poetry. The new field set out to transform attitudes to translation in literary, linguistic, and cultural studies. We saw ourselves, put no finer point on it, as messianic. We quickly established the following priorities, which I'm now going to rush through. One, to demolish the notion of perfect equivalence across languages, since no two languages can ever have identical structures, syntax, or lexicon. To move beyond the labeling of translations as faithful, unfaithful, and to recognize that definitions of what constitutes faithfulness are continually changing to develop ideas of functional equivalence by asking what might be the relationship between what a text did in its original context and what it might do in its new one. To stress the importance of the role of translation in literary and cultural history as a source of innovative forms, innovative ideas. To revise the literary canon to include translations in a similar way to what feminist and post-colonial scholarship was seeking to do at the same time. To seek to understand how and why cultures translate at different points in time. To investigate the power relations inherent in translation, especially when one language occupies a more dominant position than the other. This, of course, very much a problem for anyone translating into English. <laughs> 
to investigate differences in translation strategies, to establish a sense of operative norms, to study the multiple agencies involved in the production and dissemination of translations. It's not just the translator and the text, it's the entire publishing and dissemination apparatus, the funding. And then to reevaluate the creative and decision-making role of the translator. So you can see we didn't set ourselves very much, really, there. It was complete. We wanted a complete revision of how, how the academy thought about translation. And this little field, calling itself translation studies, languished in the shadows through the 1980s. But then it started to take off in the next decade. Partly, I think, for some of the reasons already touched upon, that is, major changes to the political map of the world. When my introductory book called Translation Studies came out in 1980, it sold a few hundred copies. The fourth edition came out in 2014. It's been translated into over a dozen languages. It's now used as a set text for the hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of academic programs in translation studies that have mushroomed around the world. We can therefore see that even within the academic world, interest in translation is a phenomenon of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Moreover, thinking about translation has moved on considerably. If we think about Salman Rushdie's famous remark from 1991, having been born across the world, wrote Rushdie, we are all translated men, we can actually see how the idea of translation has broadened out to include now the physical experience of displacement, diaspora, and exile. Postcolonial scholars today routinely refer to cultural translation, which doesn't necessarily involve interlingual translation at all. So without going into any more detail, suffice it to say that what we have now is a multifaceted discourse of translation, with the term being used slightly differently depending on the context. I'm going to return. I'm still all right for time, aren't I? Good. Let me come back now to the distinction that Joe Balmer made between scholarship and creativity. As a translator of ancient texts, she is very, very clear that the two need to be interlinked. And I agree with her. In fact, I think I would, as, as a little aside, I would say that some of the most exciting thinking about translation that is going on um, certainly in the UK context, is actually coming from classical scholarship. And I find this very interesting. There's a wonderful series of books, which I would highly recommend to anyone, the Oxford University Press Classical Presences series, which has, I, I've, I've just acquired Son of Classics and Comics, having um, been bowled over by Classics and Comics, which was the first one. And it's, it's, it is a, a series of books that I think is doing some really rather remarkable things about translation understood in its broadest sense and the relationship between the ancient world and today. In the case of many ancient texts, all we have left are fragments, which have been the subject of centuries or even millennia of transcription, editing, and commentary to the point where they may not even be clearly definable originals. One of the things I try to get my students to do is to think of what it must have been like to have been in, for example, the 10th century, working as um, a transcriber uh, in a scriptorium in candlelight, in the freezing cold, and when perhaps particularly if they were transcribing Latin, their Latin was not particularly wonderful, and think how many mistakes were made. And I say to the students, imagine yourselves in this environment. Think, you know, here today with a click of a mouse, you can do anything. Um, you can copy, you can cut and paste. What was it like being in the scriptorium? How many errors got built into things? I'm sorry, I'm digressing here. But. <laughs> what this means actually is that there is a problem that in many cases, through these endless years of transcription, of editing, of commentary, of translating, it becomes more and more difficult even to say what an original is. If one's working with Homer or Sophocles, the task is presumably to breathe new life into long dead authors. 
But it's not just the ambiguity of the status of the extant manuscripts, nor the diversity of scholarly opinion about them that poses problems for the translator. There's another problem. With the very ancient texts, we've no idea what they sounded like. The languages in which they were composed have long since ceased to exist. And Balmer puts it, I think, very succinctly and really rather nicely. The problem, he says, is not just the meager biographical information available about a poet's life, often only surviving from sources written centuries after their deaths, but that the cultural context in which they flourished has also vanished. Not only are classical authors silent, but their texts come from a silenced, long-dead world, a world that must be reconstructed from the rubble. And each generation's reconstruction can be torn down and rebuilt to a completely different model by the next. But this image, of course, of reconstructing from the rubble reminds us of Walter Benjamin, whose essay, The Task of the Translator, has become one of the most important pieces of writing about translation in the 20th century. Benjamin compares translation to the piecing together of fragments from a broken vessel, as to lovingly and in detail incorporate the original's mode of signification. He dismisses as completely pointless a continuing debate about what he calls traditional concepts of translation, fidelity and license, arguing that although these terms appear to be in conflict with one another, they are, I quote, no longer serviceable to a theory that looks for other things in a translation than the reproduction of meaning. For Benjamin, translation is the act that ensures the survival of a text. And he acknowledges that ensuring that survival necessarily involves change. I quote, the task of the translator consists in finding that intended effect upon the language into which he or she is translating, which produces in it an echo of the original. Translation, he proposes, is an activity which does not find itself at the center of the language forest, but on the outside, facing the wooden ridge. It calls into it without entering, aiming at the single spot where the echo is able to give, in its own language, the reverberation of the work in the alien one. I love that image. I love the idea of the translation personified, calling into the dark forest of language, hoping for an echo. One of the echoes for me, of course, is Dante, the Selva Oscura, in which Dante finds himself at the start of the Divine Comedy, from whence he embarks on his epic journey through hell, purgatory, and ultimately paradise and the indescribable presence of God. But another echo is a tiny poem, which some of you may know, by Wang Wei, master poet of the Tang Dynasty. And I want to turn now in my last 10 minutes, five minutes, okay. Um, it's a little book put together by Elliot Weinberger and Octavio Paz, and it's called 19 Ways of Looking at Wang Wei, subtitled How a Chinese Poem is Translated. The poem in question is a four-line poem that was one of a series of 20 on various sites near the Wang River, written as part of a horizontal landscape scroll. So, Here's the starting set of problems for the translator. Basic problem of the question of the language in which the poem is written. Difficulties of translating an ancient Chinese um, text into a modern European language. And the book has examples of English, Spanish, and French versions. The problem of a text consisting of ideograms representing words of a single syllable. The fact that the original, dating from the 8th century AD, has been lost and the earliest surviving copy is from the 17th century, which means that the poem has undergone nearly a thousand years of comment, transcribing, and then of course there's the ongoing problem of interpretation. Given that, as Paz puts it, commenting on his own attempt at a translation, the poem carries to an extreme the characteristics of Chinese poetry, universality, impersonality, absence of time, absence of subject. In Wang Wei's poem, the solitude of the mountain is so great that not even the poet himself is present. This is nature poetry, but Buddhist nature poetry. Transformation of man and nature before the divine light. 
Wangwei's mountain and forest are emblems of the void. Now, Paz refers, albeit briefly, to the Western tradition of mystical poetry, exemplified in the writings of um, San Juan de la Cruz. Now, this is a very interesting comparison, and it brings to the fore another difficulty in translating Wang Wei, because whilst his poem focuses on stillness, when we think of St. John, we are confronted with anything but stillness. We're confronted with the raging struggle between faith and doubt. La noche oscura del alma, the dark night of the soul, that we associate with the mystical poetry of the Catholic West. And the point to note here, I think, that's important, is that translation is an activity that involves not only writing or rewriting, but it also involves a very careful preliminary reading. The translator is first of all a reader. The translator has to take decisions about what to do with the text, mindful of for whom that text is destined. So that how then to bridge not only a linguistic, the linguistic and stylistic gaps, but the cultural gaps. How to bring a text written in one cultural context to readers with one kind of understanding for readers trained to read in a completely different way. Can the mysticism of one religion be translated in such a way as to be meaningful for readers used to a completely different kind of mysticism in poetry? What I find very useful about this little book is that not only does it give us 19 versions of the same poem, including a transliteration and a character-by-character -character translation, but Weinberger provides a comment on the versions of each facing page. Commenting on the first book-length translation of Wang Wei in English, Weinberger says, in its way, a spiritual exercise. Translation is dependent on the dissolution of the translator's ego, an absolute humility towards the text. A bad translation is the insistent voice of the translator. That is, when one sees no poet and hears only the translator speaking. And alas, in this little volume, we hear rather a lot of translators speaking. Weinberger and Paz praise too. They praise Kenneth Rexroth's 1970 version, um, described, which they describe as, the poem Wang might have written had he been born a 20th century American. <laughs> and Gary Snyder's 1978 version is described as a reimagining that exists as an American poem and yet continues in a state of restless change. Those are the only two they like. Now, a book such as this, which compares different translations, can tell us an enormous amount about translating. And it offers a challenge to the old discourse about faithfulness and accuracy. Some of the translators of Wang Wei opt to include personal pronouns, adding an I speaker or a you. Some go for rhyme what I sometimes, rather bad rhyme, what I call birthday card rhyming. <laughs> Some create a narrative, inventing a storyline as they select from the ideograms and try to make sense of the words. They all have to decide on a verb tense. The very first translation by um, a man called William John Bainbridge Fletcher, who was a uh, consul in um, Haiku for several years, is a piece of doggle, and I'm, I'm going to read you the bit of doggle just so you get a sense so lone seem the hills, there is no one in sight there. But whence is the echo of voices I hear? The rays of the sunset pierce slanting the forest, and in their reflection green mosses appear. <laughs> now, I find that a dire piece of, of, of poetry. It is a birthday card <laughs> bit of doggerel. It also doesn't make sense. How are green mosses reflected in sunset rays? It's a very, raises some very odd things. Um, <laughs> He also, however, appears to have been unfamiliar, he did that in 1919, unfamiliar with a book that had come out in 1915, four years earlier, and had transformed what we think about the translation of Chinese poetry. And I am referring, of course, to Ezra Pound's Cathay. Now, whatever one may think about the, I put in inverted commas, accuracy of Pound's Cathay, there have been accusations of inaccuracy, claims and counterclaims. Every time I mention this in China, I have Chinese students saying, but Pound was not a scholar. You know. um, but the, the poems are stunning. They're powerful, they're beautiful, they're elegiac, 
And another important aspect, and I am coming towards my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, is not the poems themselves, but also the context in which they were published. They came out in 1915. In 1915, Europe was at war. France was a battlefield. Pound's friend, the sculptor Henri Gaudier Bresca, was killed in the trenches that same year. But not before he had read and made an association between the poems Pound had translated and the immediate context in which they were being read. A world at war. And I just give you a few lines from Pound's version of the Song of the Bowmen of Shu. And think of these lines in comparison to the, the dog roll of Wang Wei that I've just read you. We have no rest, three battles a month. When we set out, the willows were drooping with spring. We come back in the snow. We go slowly, we're hungry and thirsty. Our mind is full of sorrow. Who will know of our grief? And Pound's Café was read completely unexpectedly as a collection of poems about the desolation of war, as the readers were affected by the prevailing conditions of the time in which it appeared. He might have set out to bring classical Chinese poetry to English language readers, but what he actually did was to create poems that spoke to a traumatized generation in terms of both the subject matter and the formal structure. And I think the reception of Cathay is a fascinating example of what I call the unpredictability factor in translation. For no one can ever quite know how a text is going to be received and what its fortunes are going to be in the receiving culture. Sometimes works deemed insignificant in the source culture become enormously important when they're received, or vice versa. Works that have high canonical status in the source fail to reach readers in another. But despite the unpredictability of reception, translators translate with a particular audience in mind, shaping their words to suit the context. I think this is true of translators of sacred texts, literary texts, commercial, legal, medical texts. The task of the translator is to bring a work to a new readership, and that involves reading, decoding, recomposing, rewriting. It also involves understanding the norms of the prevailing time, both aesthetic and ethical. Sometimes translators play safe and follow dominant norms. At other times, translators disobey, as any creative writer may do, and so create something quite new. But all translators have that dual responsibility of respecting the source as well as respecting the new readers. And so the moral, ethical dimension of translating is ever-present. Now, in conclusion, Ted Hughes was not only a major English 20th century poet, he was also a prolific translator. Together with Daniel Weisbort, um, he founded the journal Modern Poetry in Translation in 1967, and in subsequent editorials, he tried to explain his own translation practice. He described it as a series of stages. The first stage for him was what he called word for word, an experience of, I quote, the oddity and struggling dumbness of the first encounter. But this he saw as essential for the translator to be able to try and see the original like a radiographer looking at an X-ray image of a human body. Only in that first stage of engaging with the unfamiliar can a translator then start to shape the text into something new. The strangeness produced by the literal rendering is, for Hughes, what makes the imagination jump. The next stage is to work with that and transform it into something to reach the new readers. Hughes believed that a translator was always engaged in a search for something other, for what he, even, he describes it as the mythical essence of a text created in another language in another world. And the translators of the King James Bible were also searchers. But their task was complicated by the need to find something, to produce something, I should say, that would be aesthetically satisfactory and would steer a course between the rocks of diverse, often conflicting religious interpretations. And they were mindful that their task had another dimension. 
for the objective of translating the sacred Christian book, and probably the same can be said for translating all sacred texts, was that it could be used. That it could be used, as stated in the preface with which I began this lecture, to open windows to let in the light, a light that has the potential to illuminate us all. Thank you. So we're going to take questions. There's going to be two volunteers who are going to pass out uh, mics. Uh, they'll come around the room. So just raise your hand, and the volunteers will get the mic to you. We've got uh, about 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, so just raise your hand, and the, the, the mic will come to you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, inspiring. And um, I'm interested in something you said at the very end, referring to the experience of the readers of the translation as integrally important to the translator's work. And I, I wonder what your thoughts might be about how to, um, as a translator, to open to that aspect as an ongoing, as a relational part of our, our work. Thank you. I, I think they, I've thought so hard about this over the years, and I think about it every time I'm translating anything. And I, I do see there as being a dual responsibility. But I think, I think I have come down on prioritizing the readers. I think I've come down on that side, which doesn't mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean that, that, that I have a feeling of disrespect for the source. But if, if I could give you just an example to illustrate this, I was translating, I was asked to translate a, a poem for a feminist collection of ecological poetry. <laughs> and I wanted to translate, because I'd been working on a rather wonderful woman, um, a late 16th, early 17th century Anglo-Latin poet. And she had written what I thought was a terrific poem. She, she lived in Prague, about a flood in Prague. And I thought, this woman hasn't been published since, I think the last edition of her works to come out was in 1745 in Leipzig. So I thought, right, I'm going to bring her into a new generation of readers. I'm going to, in a sense, give her new life with the Benjaminian notion. But at the start of the poem, there were some very erudite classical references that I figured my readers simply wouldn't get. I didn't want to use footnotes. I cut them out. So I chopped about six lines of her poem. And I turned it then into, into something else. Now, what's the ethics of this? You know, is it, is it, had I been doing that for a scholarly edition, I could have used footnotes. But I wasn't doing it for a scholarly edition. I was doing it for a book of an anthology produced by Virago Press of feminist ecological verse. And so I opted for the readers. Now, again, as I say, there are ethical implications on this, but I felt justified in removing the lines that I knew would, would be impossible for my readers to get at without detailed assistance and classical knowledge. I, was I right? Was I wrong? I don't know. The poem got published. She, she came into English for the first time ever, and people actually read one of her poems, or what purported to be one of her poems. 
I guess I just would ask as a, as a quick follow-up, have you thought about a way to, um, or ways to, because the, by virtue of the fact when you're sitting with the translation and you're working on it, you're making assumptions about the reader, is there a way to bring that into a live interaction that you've contemplated? I, th I think it's, again, I think it's, 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 it's problematic because, you know, if I sit down to write a poem, I don't think who's going to read it. I, I, might, I might think about, I might, if I'm tinkering with something afterwards, think about where is it going to be published, in which case who might be reading it. But I, I don't know, I think I'm a little bit wary about actually saying, right, these are the readers, because then I'm second-guessing how readers will read, and we can't know that. And I think that that's one reason why I quoted the pound, because the, I, I think the last thing that ever went through Pound's mind was that he would be seen as a war poet. But the circumstances, the moment, the way the, way the poems were read, that did it. That he'd also changed the way in which English language readers thought, and I think to some extent still do, think about Chinese poetry, was another matter. But, it, but there is a random factor in translation where readers are going to do things that we can't imagine. Question here. So that, that really was wonderful. And I wonder if you might share some of your reflections about the calling of a translator versus other modes of expression, like original creative writing or original uh, critical scholarship. I understand they're not mutually exclusive, but if you're doing one, a focus on one, you're probably not doing as much of the other. Um, one of the things we, 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 we started out to do in when we were kind of putting together our, our initial thoughts about translation studies, one of the things we became quickly very aware of is that although poet, well let me let me turn it around another way the low status accorded to translation in the western academy has meant that often the important translation work done by many writers has not been recognized you find that that, that um once we started inviting people to kind of rethink literary history, one of the things that you find is how many writers were also translators and translated and wrote in and out. So actually making a distinction between creative writing and translation, I, now, I no longer do that because I think it, all, it, it, it comes in together. There's a great many people who are doing both and using sometimes the, the activity of translating to, as a sort of, in a sense, logical next step in where they might go in their writing. However, I also think that there, there is such, a, I think there is a kind of calling um, of many translators who see, and I'm sure there are very many in this room, who see the task of bringing texts that I mean, as we heard last night in that wonderful discussion, not just hundreds, but thousands of texts that have been unavailable. So the making available, I would see as another kind of almost missionary element. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I, I, I get the sense you're so deep in it, it may be hard for you to take a step back, but at some point, <laughs> at, at some point you must have made a choice on this particular career, particularly since, you, as you say, it wasn't the most illustrious career potential available to you with, with your skill set. And so I get the sense there's a, there's a gene you have I'd like to understand a little bit better that particularly drew you so passionately to pursue this, this career. I think it, it, it comes from what I was saying. That's why I included the autobiographical asides. When I was little, I realized that, that languages were different and that one looked, and I also found that in talking to people who didn't have that, who didn't have another language, it became then quite important, I think, for me to try and get across the, 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 the I would say actually, I would see it even as a need to try and understand that there is more than one way of looking at the world. I think that's what translation does. Translation shows you that there are multiple ways of thinking and, and being. And one of the great things about comparing translations of the same text is that one can see this 
this huge variation. Okay. I think I got it now. Thank you so much. Right. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, really inspiring uh, talk. Um, it's fascinating to, to be really informed and educated about the history, particularly behind the critical thinking about translators uh, in the Western context and beginning with King James. I've always really admired that particular translation of the Bible. And I see it almost like a kind of a literary mm. piece of writing. Um, I wanted to pick up on this kind of paradox of the place of translation versus the original and the question of authority that comes with it. What exactly is the translated text? Um, we are here a room full of people who are working primarily from the Tibetan sources and although English is a major language, is the dominant language, but here we have a kind of, in terms of the hierarchy, it's the, it's, it's the other way around, the Tibetan language, the source language has the authority, and the, the, the target language, English, has less of an authority, and it's attempt to bring the Tibetan text into English. So the question is, um, you know, to what extent, because, you know, many of the translators are here, are quite afraid of taking liberty yes. when they produce an English text. They don't want to be accused of being unfaithful mm. and all the rest, but the fact remains translation is a new kind of work. So, but on the other hand, you know, many of us here know that people would rather read Tsongkhapa than Tupten Jimpa. I mean, that's, that's a fact, you know. So, you know, people would read Nagarjuna rather than, you know, Mark Sideris, who did a new translation. So the, the, so the paradox of the translator is to how, where do you draw the boundary? I mean, particularly in relation to texts that have kind of authority yeah. of the author. So if you can say something about, more about that, thank you. There's, there is a, a, um, a book in, in production um, at the moment, which is looking at, I think, the editors have assembled 180 translations of Dante's Inferno. And um, there are a lot more than that, but this is their, their particular selection. They've selected 180. And some of those translations, well, some of those translations, let's say, are quite well known. Some of them go for verse. One of the translations is by a, an American poet called Mary Jo Bang. And she has taken the approach, which is that Dante's Inferno is absolutely full of contemporary references which are going to mean nothing to 20th century, 21st century readers, I should say, uh, to 21st century readers without footnotes. So why not make them contemporary? Why not fill them full of references to um, American politicians and um, <laughs> popular culture? At one point, she even has characters, characters from South Park appearing in the, in, in the inferno. She has Cartman in the inferno. So, <laughs> now, one may say, this is outrageous, this is, this is, is les majesté, this is, is, is an attack on Dante. But you can actually see part of what she's, she's doing. She's saying, how am I going to give my, how am I going to give my, my American readers a sense of what Dante was actually doing as a political commentator and a political satirist. So that she has made. Now, of course, the other thing you could immediately say is, well, it's going to date, isn't it? And of course it is. I mean, you know, this was produced in, I think, 2011, 2012, and of course, with the recent US elections, <laughs> it's rather different. But um, I, I, I'm just using that as, as, as a, a rather facile example, but I think it's, it's, it's an example of where a translator has thought, and, and really, I think, to some extent, she has, she has prioritized the content and the function over the aesthetic. And James Holmes, who I, I referred to as, as the inventor of the term translation studies, he came up with something that I thought was terrific. He said, every translator establishes 
what he calls a hierarchy of correspondences. So that you look at the text you're translating and what you can do, and then you establish a hierarchy. So it may be, is the verse form reproducible? If not, do I leave the verse form? Is rhythm important? Is, and I think that hierarchy of correspondences, and when I've done creative writing classes with translators, this is absolutely fascinating because people's sense of the hierarchy of what corresponds between the two is so different. And it depends not only on where they're aiming it, but also how they read it. Because then I come back to the importance of the translator as a reader. So you get these very different readings. <laughs> well, thank you again. That was wonderful. And my question really is a follow-up uh, on this question. I was thinking in terms of respect for the reader. <laughs> now, by the time many of us fall in with this cabal, and then get enough training to start translating, um, we have become older. <laughs> and many of us uh, uh, fall on the baby boomer side. And yet the audience we're writing for, although it includes us, also includes millennials and even those who came after millennials. So, so my question is, how do we write being older and of a different generation, and the next generation really do think differently about many things. Uh, how do we respect that? In, in, in traditional translation, you might have someone whose native language is Tibetan combining and collaborating with someone whose native language is English. Do we also have to add a millennial? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean including emojis, but... <laughs> That's, that's a brilliant question. They're all brilliant questions, but that is, that is a fabulous question. And I have to tell you that three weeks ago, I listened to a, um, one of my postgraduates at Glasgow who did a presentation. Um, and she, she is about to embark on a master's dissertation. She's, she's been working on um, subtitling. And she is now looking at the ways in which she can use emojis with screen subtitling as a kind of shorthand. And I sat there, absolutely, I thought, oh my goodness. But I, I, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that is such a, good, such a good question. I still believe, though, that we must translate, as translators, into the language we feel comfortable with. So, for example, one of the things I've never liked is what I call false archaizing. And you used to get an awful lot of that at one point in time, these and thous and twas and all of this. The false archaizing is, is a problem because if, if I, I, it, it would be a false archaizing. So I think if I were trying to write in the sort of language that, that my, what can I think of, my, my son uses, I would fail. So I think one has to write in, in, in one's own language. But I also think, and this is where the reading thing becomes so important, to be very mindful of precisely what you're saying, that there are generational changes and language changes because language is so dynamic. And English particularly changes incredibly rapidly. But I think that's a, a, a very, very interesting point to reflect on. Thank you. In terms of um, correspondences that you were talking about earlier, do you think that um, you have different uh, considerations in terms of uh, translation theory and methods when we're talking about religious literature and canonical literature, where it's coming from a place of sometimes inspiration or a very particular context of direct maybe association? That does the, Do you feel that the translator has to have some sort of relationship in, this, in a similar regard to the actual original writing? I think a translator always has to be well prepared. I think one of the, I quoted Josephine Balmer, one of the things I like about her is that um, she has argued that for a long time you had classical scholarship and translation as two distinct areas. Her argument is she could not translate. She did a, a, a splendid collection of ancient Greek um, women poets, and in which she 
used extensively classical scholarship, because a lot of what she was translating were just fragments, but also posed the basic question, would there even have been something, a category of women's poetry in ancient Greece? So the very fact of how we categorize today is, is, is different. But I think it is terribly important that, a trans that, that before one begins to translate anything, that we feel, we feel we know what we're doing, that we've understood it. To, to, to use Pound again, Pound says, when a translator isn't, isn't quite clear about what is being translated, the translation wobbles. He uses that word about wobbling. And the German translation theorist, um, Armin Paul Frank, wrote about something which I like an awful lot. He wrote about the Kopftheater, the theater in the head. You, you, you have to envision, you envision what it is that, that you're translating. So I think, I don't know if this is strictly answering your question, I don't believe, I think the act of translation for whatever kind of text is basically the same process. I don't see as a distinction, I think in the, the when translation studies was establishing itself, there were a number of people who said, oh yes, but you can't talk about literary translation or sacred translation in the same terms as you can talk about technical translation. I actually think you can, because I think the, 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 the issues are the same. But I do think that preparation, preparation is absolutely vital. So I'm afraid we have to stop. So I'm afraid we have to cut this uh, conversation short. Uh, thank you again, Professor Basnet, for a fascinating <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Uh,